Oh, yes. And we are live as we Who? look at the beautiful face of Pete Atkins <laughs> right there. And I'm just waiting for my stuff to catch up on the other side to make sure that they're getting it. Who painted uh, that? Uh, that? Well, that well, that is exactly what we're going to share in just a second. As soon as oh. I see myself coming up live here on the thing, cool. it's always interesting when I'm watching this, right? Because of our delays on YouTube, people are just looking at this picture going, what are they saying? No, yes. You're, you're live. It, we Very can good. see you up in the corner of the thing. All right. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just stop my share and say, hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to your creative journey live. I'm Kevin Gregg. I'm Paul Carganilla. And we've I'm got Pete, Pete Atkins. Atkins. Hey, Pete Atkins. Yes. He's back. Hi. So glad to have you guys here with us again. Actually, I'm going to share that again because this is a really cool thing. Actually, Pete was just talking about this, this painting. Look at that painting, man. Isn't that awesome? That's this, so cool. I was just asking about it. And you were um, like, oh, no, why are you you're zooming in on the cigarette? I've quit for seven years. You did. Wow. Congratulations. It's a big deal. Pete yeah. and I used to Pete and I used to smoke together, as a matter of fact. You used to smoke, Kevin? Paul, I used to be a pack a day smoker. No way. Was, yes, I was a pack a day smoker. <laughs> All right. We're gonna share maybe uh, you know, I should say I'm gonna save that, that story. Frozen. I'll save that story God. for the look, look at that. Look at that. I'm gonna save that story for the I'm gonna save that story for the audio podcast. Hey, let's do all this. We're gonna share, we're gonna talk about that painting in just a second. We'll get to the audio podcast in just a minute. Um, but we want to say hi to all of our folks that are on YouTube. Hey everybody, good to see you. Hi, Meryl's everybody. here. Who else is here? Rick Lee is here. Look at that. He's ready Rick for Lee. round. Two. Love Rick hey, Lee. Rick. Uh-oh. Everybody, look out. Kate McLaughlin is here. Kate oh. McLaughlin is on the feed. <laughs> is she, well, really, is she really here? Or has no. she acknowledged that she she's off watching Dairy Girls, right? She's just gonna she loves Dairy Girls. Is that is that streaming just on Netflix or is that streaming on uh what is that that I believe is on Netflix. That's where we've started watching it. But uh... what is with this piglet thing again? I was just testing it to see if my screen share <laughs> was working. I don't know why that took like five years to start. But this is like an inside joke amongst all of Polly's oh, crowd. Everyone's <laughs> favorite armadillo. Everybody starts to fight. Is it a pig or is it an armadillo? armadillo. I always say it's a pig. Pete, how about you? That's yeah. Piglet from Winnie that's, the Pooh. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, he's a baby armadillo. Oh boy, it's a piglet. It's a wow. pig. It's a baby pig. So, well, here's here's the thing, Paul. <laughs> Hashtag times up, my friend. We don't get to decide <laughs> if that creature identifies as a pig. <laughs> yeah, well, better call him a pig. <laughs> Has anyone ever asked him though? <laughs> Does yeah, he know well, his email he, signature he's line? what I know. Pig, he's what pig, I know. Pig. <laughs> the writer sure. and illustrator and publisher of those books. Is Piglet a boy or a girl, Piglet. even? All right, boys. So, we're going. You know, <laughs> we're we're made, going. You know what it's called, Paul? It's called ghost naming. Don't do that, man. <laughs> That's like calling Caitlyn Jenner by <laughs> that other name. Oh, boy. He, Boy, might we, been, he might have been born armadillo, but we don't call him armadillo here because he. This, uh, <laughs> we haven't even started yet, and That's it's already gone down a path. <laughs> anyway, so glad to have all you guys here. Look at these guys, Christina, Angelica, Kelsey, Diana. Glad to have you here. Producer Craig is here. Producer Craig, we're going to have a couple of things coming your way. Uh, we'll save it for the we'll save it for the audio podcast because I definitely want to mention that. Paul, I'll introduce us in, and, and we'll get Craig, going. Oh, good to see you, bud. Okay, sounds good. Sound good. All right, here we go. Uh, audio podcast starting in five, four, three. Hello, everyone, and welcome to your creative journey. My name is Kevin Gregg, and I'm Paul Carganilla with a protected memory card. Oh, good. Oh, does that mean that you have to, do you have to like stop it and redo it? What are you doing? I have to take it out and slide the thing again and push it back in and see if it'll take it now. That's okay. That's no worries. This said. is what, 
This yeah, is I'm rolling. This is what we do. That's okay. I could take the Zoom audio. That, that's a big question for me. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, Paul. This I'm not even started. you're you're so comfortable with it. You're so cocky now. You just don't even I'm so it. comfortable that literally we've got to do that audio record again because I missed Good all of that. Just started. We literally <laughs> just started it because well, guys, this is what happens behind the scenes of a podcast. Let's try it again in five, four, three. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Your Creative Journey Podcast. I'm Kevin Gregg. I'm Paul Carganilla with a fully functioning memory card that is recording as we speak. Oh, we are so glad to have you here on the show that is designed to inspire you so that you take action and get your creative work done. Whether you're an actor, writer, director, singer, dancer, painter, musician, frisbee thrower, what else, Paul? Firefly, armadillo, pig. Oh. Boy, girl, him, her. What is this? Okay, all right. Well, King we the callback. King if you're, of the callback. If you're hearing all of that, that means we're doing a little callback from what we're talking about. No, it just you, means this this podcast is right for you, whether you correctly identify as an armadillo <laughs> or a pig. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's how it is. Hey, joining us again, a return guest, another return guest, which we're so excited about. It is the incomparable Peter Atkins. Welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me back. Welcome. Hi. So excited Great to be have here. You back. Yes. He's a writer. He's a screen. He's a, he's a writer, screenwriter, author, master of the macabre, whatever mm. you want to say. That's Sounds how he is. Excellent. All right. Uh, so glad to have you back, Pete. Such a joy. Uh, we're going to get into it. There's plenty to talk about, but as we start every week on the show, we begin this show by talking about what was the best thing that happened in your week. And Paul, I'm throwing it to you, buddy. I think you've got some great news to share. Do you, you? start with me? Let's start with you. Fine. Kevin Fine. Gray. What was the best thing that happened to you this week? I'm going to tell you something great. Actually, Pete got to be a part of it, and so did Dana. Uh, Maddie's band, Swells, got to do a live stream event on Twitch, on the video service Twitch. And uh, it was awesome, man. They did, it was sort of, they'd done sort of a launch party for their album, Love Love Olympics, right? Mm -hmm. And is that the name of the album? Love Olympics. I'm his dad. Yes. That is Love Olympic or Love Olympics. That's the big question. What Kate, kind of you better. Father, are you? Good I don't know. God. I'm such a dad. That's a deal. Here's my point. Swells did a fantastic job. <laughs> they got to have a firsthand taste, Paul, of what it's like, what you guys do on a weekly basis, as you guys are like trying to switch back and forth and do all the music stuff. It was just a blast. I couldn't I was have been. ask, how did it go? Were they all together or did they record separately and edit? So, so they did this. So they did many segments that were together. They made sure that everybody was testing for COVID to make sure that everybody was negative when they did it. So they kind of all gathered together to make sure the stuff was happening. They're even doing testing afterwards, but it was, it was a, it was a little bit like, um, uh, quarantine with friends, you know, the other show that you guys have on, on uh Vaudacity network, it's like they would do, there'd be musical segments and then they would cut away to uh filmed video segments, which was awesome. So you can find that on Twitch, uh, twitch.com, I think it is. And you can just look up swells band and see a replay of their stuff. It was awesome. I couldn't have been more prouder of him. Uh, and then we've just been clipping along, just getting ready for Christmas. I was super happy today because like I've talked about here, I haven't gone too much in detail. I've had a few side writing projects to just make a little bit of money. I got some stuff in today under a deadline, which Pete is very aware of deadlines. There can be beasts. I love I, oh. Do you know the famous Douglas Adams quote about deadlines? <laughs> Douglas Adams is the guy who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and other books and what's his what's his quote about deadlines i love deadlines i love that whooshing sound as they fly past my head <laughs> i'm gonna tell you man that is so much how i felt you know when i do some stuff through i'm, I'm gonna peel the layers back a little bit i've been doing some of these gigs through um upwork which is like a freelancing thing so you can find these occasional stuff I forget Upwork, however they have created it, they have it on um, Britain time, right? So it's like eight hours ahead. So even though I'm like, you know, I'm putting in my stuff and going, that's great. I've got a deadline. I can get it in by tonight. And then I go, nope, I have to get it in by four o'clock today. The next 30 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> yes, right. I got to get well, it that's in. Horrible. So. That's well, horrible. Well, 
it's it's what it is for some of the time stuff. They, but I was very happy to be working on this this project that I've been doing with a with a client, and I was very glad to get it in. And you know, listen, deadlines. Do you care are, what it was at all? Or? Not yet, not yet. I'm gonna just. I it's a. I can I can tell you this. It is a nonfiction project that I'm working on with a client. So that's kind of that's as much as I can tell you. So, but it's it's been a joy working with this gentleman on it. So that is was UK based, or is it? Are they I, just messing with the clients? I don't see. Here's my thing, man. I believe somebody's going to get on there and say, "I am a representative of right, Upwork, how and how dare you?" Dare you? <laughs> Uh, I try to set my stuff for Pacific Standard Time, um, but it seems to recognize everything as Greenwich time. So, well, you know what? Because I've I I um, hired a couple of people for the post and Haunted Man through Upwork. I hired our our visual effects guy and our Great. color colorist. And you have the ability. I mean, the person who who is the hirer, yes, lawyer, has the ability to set the deadline. Yes. So they must have said it, however. Yeah, I have a couple of clients that I've been working with. And for some reason, especially when it comes to like, there's one project that I'm working on. Sorry. Sorry, guys. I'm going into the oh, boring. Uh, yeah, tell us more. <laughs> tell us more about your humdrum. Tell us some more in excruciating detail. Tell us more about your humdrum online work, will you, Kevin? I'm here. Uh, curious because i i like to take these beginnings of the show when we catch up with each other as like also seeing like where your creative stuff is and it, you're, yeah, you're like fighting deadlines writing something that's exciting to me i want to know what you're it's at. it is good i will tell you what is the what's the challenging thing because i also had a, a side meeting this this week on, a, on another project that i've been working on for myself mm -hmm. it is it's very frustrating when you're spending a lot of time and energy on somebody else's project and you realize you're not spending the time on your other, on your own stuff that you're supposed to be developing. That's what I say is for me, it's, it's one of these things of like, oh, what is going on here with me that I'm, you know, I'm pushing myself, you know, as hard as I can to get this thing done and I can't do the same thing for my own stuff. You know, I always let like, you know, mm. other things come and get in the way. So Anyway, that's a little bit of where I'm at. So, yeah, I mean, but that's interesting creatively anyway, because I mean, that ties into the whole self starter issue, I guess, yes. for all of us. And I mean, it, it's, it's different for everybody, but it sounds to me like you have, which we all learn in school, you know, that kind of the authority figure, the, the homework giver is actually useful to you in the sense that even if it makes you feel uncomfortable, it's like that guy who, perhaps psychologically is a, a teacher with a ruler, you know, yeah. is like, I, yeah. I, or a nun. It's like, I, I better get, I got to get that thing done. And wh when it's a self-start, even though theoretically we love our self-start stuff more, I know. it is hard. It's, it's I hard know. to, because you're not your own authority figure. So I kicked around this idea and I've heard this technique before and I don't, I don't have the courage enough to do this yet, but I have heard people that have done this technique and, and put and fill in the blank for whatever you want. They take a small vial of poison. <laughs> they know that they've only got 18 hours to free the antidote out of the safe. So it usually works, Kev. That every, is a good deadline. So you can think of this. I'm going to say this. I know everybody on this, this, you know, on this meeting and on whoever's watching it all has their different affiliations or different things that they want. But think of the one organization that you would never want to donate to ever. <laughs> and then you write something like a $500 check that is to that organization and you hand it to a friend and you say, if I do not finish my project by X time, you are allowed to send that check to that organization, right? So mm. just think of that because Pete, I can see you thinking in your mind which organizations you would not want to donate to. And I know which organizations I would not want to donate to. It's a very a, negative, right? This is a small Venn diagram of overlap. But for the most <laughs> part, they would be different groups, I yes. suspect. Yes. Um, but let me just say, big yes. picture, 
Yeah. That's psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> don't ever do that. That is insane. Um, oh, why don't I'm, you just say to your friend, yes. here's a $500 check in your name. Yeah. Yeah, but then I feel terrible, right? That's the other part that would oh, kick yeah. in. <laughs> right I would feel terrible. I'd feel like, hey, remember that $500 check I gave you? I need you to rip it up. <laughs> because you, I met my deadline. Because you helped me. You helped me achieve what I wanted to have. Right. Now and rip up that say, check. Wow, I feel really good about that, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, right? Let's do it again like, next month. Well, because then your friend, because then your friend would be on the other side of like going, you know, <laughs> then it'd be about like, just make sure that you give me that text or that phone call as soon as you've got it done. And then your friend could just like disappear and go, I never, I never got the call from you. So oh, my wife, I dropped out, dude. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> anyway. Well, look at this jacket I bought. <laughs> look at that. I made my deadline, man. It was amazing. Anyway, anyway, that's great. It's, it's always you. good to meet a deadline. It's always good to meet a deadline. Paul, what was the best thing that happened in your week, buddy? I can't pick one. I'm going to do a top four. I'm going to count down New Year's Eve style, and I'm going to be real quick. Number four. Yes, sir. This morning, I got to do take part at work. I got to take part in a Make-A-Wish Foundation thing for a kid nice. uh, with the police department. And, you know, I did that. I've done that a ton through Disney, working at, at Disneyland. Yeah. Uh, and, but it was always like I was just a part of the event. Like with this, I was actually able to work with the police department and the Make-A-Wish Foundation to help organize it. And uh, just seeing the joy on the kid's face was just like, oh, as a father, especially now, it's just, it was like, oh my God, so amazing. So, so, right. so great. Love and it. then um, I'll say number three, uh, on the variety show this past Saturday, we did our very first live table reading of a script that I wrote. We had, uh, thanks to our, te our technician, Sam, backdrops for the scenes. This, all, all the actors were on wow. Zoom. So we were on Zoom. We had the backdrops for the scene. We, he was piping and scoring that I gave him musical cues for throughout. So we did a full, like 30, it, it's a short that I wrote, 30 page short with scene work, back, oh. backdrops, some, some costume stuff. And yeah. It was just so cool. And so, Paul, you did it all. You did it all live, right? You did all it all live, live, all through Zoom. Wow. Just like this. And was everybody, everybody was just facing camera. You didn't get too fancy where you started doing like oh, off angles or yeah. right. It's and that lot. was the difficult thing too, in that it was a table read, like nobody was off book. So, yeah. and even in a regular table read, you can look at your script and look at your scene partner. But yeah. here on Zoom, you're looking at your script for the line, and then you have to look at your webcam. You're not even yeah. watching the performance of your scene partner. So yeah. that was a big challenge. But um, we did we did one rehearsal beforehand, and um, Sam, who was in in the in the rehearsal, he was just like, "You have to look in your webcam, otherwise, like, we're, yeah. there's just no connection yeah. for the audience." Uh, and we're just like, "That's really weird," because normally I'm looking at I'd be looking at you, Kevin, if we're doing right. a scene, but now I'm looking. At at a webcam and I'm not getting anything back from you. Wow. So that was really interesting. And the other interesting thing too was uh, based on the program that we run through Zoom through, we weren't seeing the backgrounds, we weren't hearing the music, yeah. but everyone who was watching on YouTube live was seeing the backgrounds and hearing the music. So it was just oh. like so much of your imagination had to be involved in it. Uh, Amazing. It was really great. I got to go back and watch the replay because it's on right now, right? It's on the, it's, it's on the poly replay right now. Saturday night. It's at the end of the show. So you, you're familiar with Sparked. I don't know if you ever saw The Flame, yeah. which was a follow-up to Sparked. Are the, these, and this is like a trilogy. Is this what this is or no? It turned into a trilogy. It was never supposed to be, but it, it wow. turned into it. So I've written a third one. I wrote it years ago. Um, and we've never done anything with it. I've been sitting on it. And these, these stories take place on Christmas Eve and this was a Christmas episode. So I was like, what if we like incorporate them into the show somehow? And Gosh. so we showed Sparked. It was a four hour, four and a half hour show. So at one point we showed Sparked at, at another point we showed the flame. And then at the end of the show, we read the third one. Wow, buddy. It was really cool. Oh, awesome. Uh, and then number two, yesterday I got to do something so amazing again through work. Um, I guess every winter solstice, there's an, a national thing that I never knew about, which is National Homeless Persons Memorial Day, where oh. uh, organizations, churches throughout the, the country uh, dedicate like a service to remember homeless people who have died homeless in the past year oh. um, in their city or their county. And I had never heard of it, but I, I somehow through different channels at work got shoulder tapped to host a virtual 
candlelit vigil for all the homeless people who died in in our county this this year and just based on my um experience with these live events on zoom i was kind of the guy that they went to to do it and so i worked with a, a pastor in one of the churches we had speakers we had live musicians from another church playing amazing grace yeah uh, there was a reading of all the names and um it was like a 45 minute church service candlelight vigil live online last night for to remember the homeless people who had died in our county this past year and it went off smooth without a hitch and it was just so amazing to be a part of uh, spiritually for me, just because like, um, a, it was just like a, a wonderful event to be, to be a part of, but B to be able to use these skills that I accidentally kind of got this year right. to make this happen. And a neighboring city, Ventura actually does a, a, a live service every year and they didn't this year. And, um, our city has never done it before. And we, we put on our very first one virtually wow and so it was really really neat amazing man yeah. so so cool it's weird like how these incredible things have come out of this season right it's weird like the you know us doing the show or the stuff that you've been doing live or you have no idea what it's going to lead to so i'm so grateful that you had that experience man amazing amazing what's your number one so number one um kevin any other year what is the one night of the year that every live performer you know is working i'm gonna say it's new year's eve bro. it is new year's eve and it's new year's this eve. year obviously with everything going on uh we aren't working but we on the vaudacity network we wanted to do something bigger than we were we've been doing on the weekends do something live and we we hired a band of our friends uh and uh tech crew of our like sound mixers that we're really close with and um put together a live event it's going to be so it's going to be our new year's eve show but for the very first time we hired hired this band hired these people had a, a live recording and we were so nervous especially jamie and i like about the social distancing about the of course like, because you can say as much as you want we're all going to wear masks and we're all going to be six feet apart but then <laughs> like you all get there and then it's like oh that all goes out the window I but <laughs> we we got together on sunday and kevin it could not have been a better experience everyone oh even though we're all like best friends everyone was totally on it like six feet apart mm. masks on we did we turned um one of our our band members backyards into a stage and i'm going to show you a picture right now oh great i can't wait what it looks like from uh when jamie was this is my wife when she was singing one of her songs and oh again, my gosh I look at this oh, that looks so great that's, that's sam he's in the stereo uh yeah sweater and he's running the light we had three cameras uh positioned yeah. around the stage area yeah all, so all acceptably apart and uh, that's Alex. I uh, see him. Directing. I see Alex with his. I see Alex with his mask on right now too. Yeah. Look at and then uh, over on the stage, we had all the performers apart, and I, I blacked out the guitar player's face up there because we haven't announced who it is yet. Okay, but, okay. Um, with the drummer <laughs> up there with the guitar player, and everybody like we took breaks for dinner, and we did it in shifts, and we like oh. had individually wrapped, and everyone was so cool about it. Nobody ever like w made anyone uncomfortable, and we had the whole set up and the whole we had the, the sound mixers there live wow. um the cameras all set it was just the coolest oh, experience and it looks so amazing man did you guys get really a pep good. did you get a pep talk from tom cruise when you guys were on set <laughs> i was working to the oh. same gag but oh. <laughs> <Missed> that <laughs> which i, I say which i say good for him don't you ever don't you ever take that off Oh, no, I haven't heard that story. You have not heard it. I'm going to let Pete tell it because Pete's going to tell it great. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not going to tell it great because unfortunately I disagree with you, Kev. It's like oh, I, really? I okay. support the sentiment. Great. great. I can't but, wait. Well, I you, can't wait. So Paul knows Tom Cruise blew up at some crew members on I guess Mission Impossible 7. Mission Impossible, I think. Yeah. Um, because, you know, apparently they, they were not obeying social distancing as much as they should. Oh, they're apparently, shooting it right now? Yes, they are. right now. Okay. And um, as somebody leaked the tape, you know, so <laughs> that, that that's not kosher, I guess. But the thing is, he's screaming at these people. 
Now, I completely agree with the sentiment. Yes. Uh, as clearly Kev does. Yes. And I think most people, crew's got a big thumbs up overall, I would say, seems to sure. be the response. Sure. But uh, it's not a level playing field. You don't oh, get right. to scream at people when they can't punch you in the face. <laughs> You know what I mean? if, you're, if you're on the playground and uh, you figure I'm going to scream at this guy yes. Yes. and you just, you understand we, we all grow up in the yard and it's yes. like, you can scream there's a possibility the guy will punch you in the face because you're screaming at him now, yes. when you're a king like Tom Cruise is <laughs> sure. you just, you're not going to get punched in the face so you can it, it's just, it's elite abuse it's the abuse you. of working stiffs by the elite, no matter how justified yes. the sentiment was. And I'm completely on his side sure. on the issue, but like a petulant little bitch screaming <laughs> at the top of his voice <laughs> because nobody can say, what'd you say? Well, here's, here's the follow up that to that as well, Pete, which is uh, five crew members walked off after that happened. So, you okay. know, there's a lot of things. I think all of this pointing back, Paul, so glad that you guys had that experience. I know that you guys rocked it in order to make that thing happen. You know, the Tom Cruise thing, Pete, I completely get it. Hey, listen, here's oh, no, a guy. Let's talk about Paul's thing. I mean, that first of all, it looked like everybody obeyed the social distancing. So nobody. <laughs> well, there was the joke. Perfect. And right? that's great that that happened. But, Paul, do, uh, do yourself a favor when this is done. <laughs> go online, listen to You can hear the audio. And you know, listen, everybody's working their tails off trying to make this happen. A lot of people in the industry. I know several people that are working in the industry. It's hard. It's hard to make this stuff happen. You look at somebody like Tom Cruise, who's, you know, freaking out with the fact of like, you know, is, is the movie industry going away? Right. Like, I mean, you're talking about here he is making another one of these tent pole movies. It's like, they may not see the type of box offices that they've been seeing for a long, long, And there's long, a lot of time. pressure on him. Of course, right. he feels right responsible for the entire industry at this point yes. mm. even but, so anyway do do yourself do you, yell down yell it. up you do know. yourself a favor paul after this is done listen to that thing and then you can go back and then when you listen to this then you'll then, then the joke will make sense but now it just doesn't I mean, you can file it with your christian bail tape and your <laughs> <laughs> anyway wonderful paul and that's coming up new year's eve uh and you guys are selling tickets for it. producer uh producer craig just put up a link in there so if you want to join the festivities for the new year's eve special that's going to be going on on audacity network click in and see something that you can only see if you click in and and get your tickets right yeah. and that's the cool thing about it too is like we we're selling tickets and it's like while everything we've done since March has been like, pay what you can tip if you can. Right. Um, and this is the first thing that like, we're actually selling tickets for what is amazing is being able to hire a band and that all the musicians are, you know, people that you care about and love and you're able to give them some work for a new year's Eve gig. Um, so I would just like to say to anybody who's on the fence about buying a ticket and coming to the event, like, please, take advantage of this opportunity to support a local musician on new year's Eve and to give them a little bit of work that you can enjoy safely from home. There you go. Great. Well said, Great. well said, well done. Uh, Pete, I just have to let you know, Maddie's on the stream and he's already said Pete's cussed. So we have to end the stream. Dad, dad, dad. Pete very, said the, you know, uh, I, Pete said the B word. <laughs> well, you know, there's a show coming up on Netflix called the history of swear words. Okay. Um, which, I, you know, I'm fascinated to watch. And they're going to talk about at what stage in the culture does a word become a swear word? Sure. Because none of these words, you know, famously the seven words that George Carlin listed as the words you can't say on TV. Yes. <laughs> they're all on TV now. Um, but, they, but they're still swear words, of course. At one point, none of these words were swear words. They were just words. Sure. Uh, even... The most obvious, you know, the F word was just yeah. a word. It was a descriptive word. Um, the S word, just a word. Yeah. And at some point, society decided, you know, that's not a nice way of talking about that thing. Sure. 
So yeah. we found, well, well, we always had, um, and well, I want to say euphemisms, perfectly good alternative words for those things. And somehow these words, you know, went over there behind the bike shed with the smokers and the juvenile delinquents. It's like they, they became the bad words. So well, I, I think that's going to be an interesting show. And I just wondered, given that Matty is causing trouble... <laughs> <laughs> that's what he does the word which i will now say rather than repeat oh you can used, don't worry pete you what, can what, use it i can bleep it out on the audio thing what, it's what fine say uh, what, what where are um like <laughs> of course i swear sure. a lot um <laughs> you do but, it so, you do it so nice i, I want to know if, if there's a sliding scale like my assumption is mm -hmm. that f first of all calling a man a b word seems to me instantly less offensive than calling a woman a B word. Okay. And, you know, there's another I, word too, which, which in English <laughs> we would happily throw around at men, but would never <laughs> say about a woman. Um, but I mean, just, you know, we, we can move on. From the I will tell you, I'm gonna, can, can I, this is a very interesting okay. thing. Paul can feel free to join in on this too. I, I'll tell you, can I tell you, number one, there's a couple of things I want to say on this. Number one, the thing that you're right about with the language, right? For example, when you look at uh, uh, David Milch's Deadwood, it's the reason why uh, David Milch used the type of language that he sure. did in Deadwood because back in the 1880s, if I said the word damn or, you know, gosh darn it or whatever it is, that was just as offensive as the replacement words that David Milch put in there, right? But he didn't want people like – you know, a modern audience, a 21st century audience wouldn't, you know, you know, gasp in horror at the use of the word heavens to Betsy, right? Yeah. <laughs> so then that's why he dropped in the type of language they did to give it sort of that punch. Um, I just want to say this, uh, just to give sort of an insight of why, here's a little background, why I tend not to use cuss words anymore, because Pete has known me. As using uh, cuss words. I've heard cuss words escape. Yes. Used to do it on a regular basis. Here's the oh. interesting thing. This is actually tied in with my sobriety, oddly enough. Oh. Uh, several years ago, as I started getting sober and started dealing with some issues for myself, I started realizing one of the issues. Here we go. I get to pull back the curtain so people see this. One of the issues that I deal with on a regular basis is a lot of people pleasing or trying to be all people to all things sure. at the same time, right? It's like a skewered version of myself. So one of those problems that I would have on a regular basis is I'd be one way with people at work or one way with friends or one way at home or one way at church or all this stuff. And it just was causing a schism with me where it was like, I wanted to be the same person in a lot of things. And I kind of got called to the mat by a friend of mine that was, you know, a Christian and he knew I was, you know, a believer in all this stuff. And he pulled me to the side and he said, Hey man, um, so I'm not sure what's your deal. Like, like I know what you believe, but then I hear some of the things in green rooms and some of those green rooms, sorry, everybody going to pull it back, but some of those green rooms at Disneyland could get filthy. They just can't. <laughs> Right? Disneyland? Yes, it, it happens. Oh. Paul goes, which green rooms were you in? Ones that you were into, buddy. Uh, so, <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, um, but I don't know. I sort of laughed at it because, you know, this guy sort of called me on the mat in a loving way. And I just went, you know what? You're right, man. And I just sort of made this decision years ago where I said, I kind of need to be the same person in all situations that I can be. And it's challenging because other people like Pete, you've known me, I've, you know, dropped the number of F-bombs, you know, and believe me, I still do drop a number of F-bombs when I get really angry. That's what I know. You feel bad about it now. That's well, I, I know, I, I know when that stuff is coming out, it's usually a good indication for me to check myself. That's really what's happening is whenever it's coming out to that level, I just go, all right, man, what's going on with me that that stuff's coming out. And the only other reason that I do that, especially on this show is that I sort of put those parameters on. Paul's been very gracious with it. Uh, dealing with my junk um but you know because part I of, so many f-bombs <laughs> <laughs> well the part of the reason i do it too is it's there's a guy that i would follow on online who made a very interesting um comment uh he made a very interesting comment about business stuff right and i think that both of you guys could identify with this you know 
people, you know, I, I hear language stuff or whatever that happens, you know, I just go, ah, all right, I get it. I get it. But there's an interesting thing that happens with certain demographics where once you drop language, you could automatically lose half your audience, right? Yeah. Whereas if you don't drop the language, you still kind of get to keep everybody at the same time. You know, does sure. that make sense? Right. It does. Because it's one of those things where if I start just dropping language, all of a sudden it's like, well, it's okay. But now I've lost a potential half of a market or whoever that would have, would have come. So it's a very selfish reason. I was going to say very venal of you, Kevin. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's really no way to approach art, is it? Well, it's, what are you going to you know, do? The, the people who would walk away from anything I'm involved in because of my filthy mouth, <laughs> screw them. Maybe that's the problem, Pete. Maybe that's the whole deal. Maybe this podcast is about you realizing, you know what? I need to clean up my act. I've been missing out on a whole other. <laughs> you know, yes. It's possible. And thank you so it's much. It's not likely. It's thank possible. Thank you so much for joining us again on the podcast, Pete. We're out of time for tonight, but uh, I hope <laughs> you'll join us for Pete Atkins part three in January. Here's what I want to say, Pete. Uh, number one, how have you been? Is there has there been some good stuff going on for you? How you know we're asking these questions of how people are. And, oh, and, oh, so yeah, right, right. The, the best doesn't matter. Week. Listen, um, I I knew that coming on, and I realized this with having Pete on the show. Pete falls into the category, uh, the same category as um, Peter O'Toole or Richard Harris would fall into when oh, they come on. Froze. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. I can. I'm sorry. There, there was no a brief squeeze there for me. No worries, buddy. I just always I say this. Pete Atkins falls into the same category as somebody like Peter O'Toole or Richard Harris when he used to pop onto the Tonight Show, right? <laughs> it's like you know that you're gonna have a lovely chat. We'll probably we'll probably chat a little bit more about his past, but then there's other stuff that I just know he's such an amazing conversationalist that it's such a great uh just such a great guest to have on. That, that, that is a lovely, lovely thing for you to say, Kevin. Thank you. Um, but you guys are too. The, the whole point about like the absence of dead air is it's very hard, as I'm sure you guys find all the time. To one guy in, in a in a group of two or three or four can't fight dead air. It's like you, people need to be quick and responsive and alert to the other people. But thank. Thank you. I thought repeat that repeat that part one more time. You repeat repeat that part one more time because for some reason your your Wi-Fi cut out for a second. When you're saying that there's two or three or four people talking at the same time. No idea what I said. I um, I I said that it's um I was just I was returning the compliment that dead air, which is you know the bane of of podcast, radio, TV, live performance, anything. Yeah. Um you want to keep the thing alive. We all want to keep the balls in the air. And I was saying that it's it's kind of you kev to say that whatever the phrase was i'm a good conversationalist you are. but uh, you know it takes two to tango or three to tango it's like you can't have um it, that that's what i'm saying it's, it's a dance uh, i'm it's saying a, right back at you i guess it's, a, it's an audio dance well but what thank I, you. But my fear was when you uh, evoked so readily uh, peter o'toole and richard harris i thought he, he's going to pick on my alcoholism from the get go, I mean, <laughs> what? Because uh, for, you know, by the way, I should now. You've probably got listeners who are under forty, right? You've probably sure. got listeners who are under thirty. Yes, who may not know the reference I just made. I was just going to say that this is the thing. Now you know because I am significantly older than you guys, and certainly significantly older, significantly older than the demographic you might have of the under 30s or the under 20s. And something you realize as you get older is there are these moments every, I don't know, you know, every seven years, every 10 years, whatever it is, where you recognize that the common cultural consciousness has shifted. It's mm. like all, all through my, I'm trying to pick some examples, all through my teens and 20s, let's say, um, which would be, the, the, for those listening, would be the 1970s and into the early 1980s. You could make certain assumptions about the names that everybody knew. Mm -hmm. And and I guess because, you know, classic film was coming into its own, then there was a sort of revival of 30s and 40s movies. So you could 
mention Humphrey Bogart, you could mention Marilyn Monroe, you could mention whoever, um, and you could just have this base assumption that everybody knows who you're talking about. And, um, and obviously there are some timeless people who seem to bridge the generations, but you do realize that when you get old enough to see decades pass, certain people who seemed so ubiquitous, so part of the mainstream of the culture, they just drop out. Yes. And um, I, I, what was that turning one for you? Like when you're talking about the set or like- well, No, it was weird. I, I, I noticed it most, <laughs> most recently uh, was, was an episode of Jeopardy. I was just watching Jeopardy mm -hmm. and- um, Kate watches it every up, night. They threw up a picture of, uh, and again, kids, this was at one time a famous person. They threw up a picture of the actor Gregory Peck. Mm -hmm. And my instinct was to sneer because I thought, my God, how, how, how much dumbing down can they do on this program? Jesus, it's Gregory Peck. Right. Nobody buzzed in. Wow. Um, and, you know, I, I don't lament for Gregory Peck. I mean, these things happen, but it was just... Uh, again, I should explain in context, it's not like he was as famous as Humphrey Bogart or as <laughs> famous as the Beatles or whatever, mm. but you get these cultural landmarks that we think are fixed yeah. and they're not. No, they're and, not. Um, just to they're sort of cl close the circle on this, uh, dear young listeners, Kevin was referring to two very famous Hellraisers, drunks, enormously talented actors who... And I don't mean drunks in like a humorous, he liked an occasional <laughs> shot. I or mean like- played it up like a Dean Martin. Like a, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. I mean like serious, serious alcohol problems, yeah. which didn't stop them continuing to do good work, no. but they were, they were as legendary for the drinking as they were for their work. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's distinctly possible that a lot of people won't know no, they they may know Richard, Richard Harris, Harris as as to go Dumbledore, the original Dumbledore, Dumbledore right? yeah. before yeah. before he passed away. But <laughs> I I just say that to say that your that your wonderful conversation, and I will point out that Hunter from Hunter's Acoustic Cabin is on and literally said in the cab uh, in the comments, "What's Jeopardy?" So uh, <laughs> just a joke. <laughs> well, that's still on. So yes. no. <laughs> Hunter, yeah. but that's on you dude I mean, <laughs> that, that's available. Gregory <laughs> Peck was Obi-Wan right <laughs> yeah that's right. That's ridiculous right. I'll tell you when I had my moment it happened working at the mad tea party uh down at Disneyland I was in my huge tweedled makeup stuff which Pete actually helped me with my British accent on that for that I, remember that. I went in and did all that stuff and what you do is I worked with Pete on well, it I, so I, I just told it. you to watch um sexy beast right or <laughs> so well, watch wait. Ray Winston um, well, I'm wait. basting I'm here's roasted. it here's oh, it. Pete was one of the Beatles right <laughs> oh boy well here's an interesting Only thing in Hamburg they replaced <laughs> him with Ringo is very sad <laughs> here's an interesting thing which is when I went in to go audition for that show that they did down at Disney California Adventure that role was originally not British stuff at all it wasn't they had us read regular stuff. And I remember I was auditioning with Martin McConville, who's on, you know, Super Ego and all this other stuff. And we got paired together to go in. And just before we went in, I just said, hey, let's mix this up. Let's try like a Cockney thing. And we went in and did a Cockney thing in the, in the audition and they changed the entire thing. So we ended up getting cast and a whole bunch of other people. And that's when I started workshopping with Pete to go, hey, man, I need your help on this to make sure I'm doing this just right. So he was brilliant. Brilliant with helping them. They out. changed it because you you guys just did it on the yeah. fly in the audition. Yeah. And they thought, yeah, that's the way to get. That's great. Yeah, because you had a whole bunch of other people coming in and just being some Texas. goons, just being goons, whatever you know. <laughs> Let's do this, Pete. I want to ask you something. We didn't get a chance last time. Can you please tell us about your early screenwriting Hollywood days? Because the last time that we left off with you, and if you want to catch up with any of this stuff that we're talking about, because there's two things. I'm going to come back to 
a rock and roll uh, reference that you just made in just a little bit. But uh, the last time that Pete was on, we talked a little bit about his um, beginning stages and, and creative stuff. And if you want to go back onto your creative journey podcast.com or take a look in any of the podcast feeds and go back and listen to that episode. So you can hear a little bit of that stuff. I would highly recommend going back on your creative journey podcast.com on the original episode page, because you got links to other episodes that he and I did on another Kevin Gregg show. But right, right. last time we left off, buddy, which we're going to get to talk about this little chunk of your story, um, screenwriting. How the heck did you fall into screenwriting and writing to begin with? You know? Sure. Um, thank God you checked back because <laughs> I don't. I just pulled it I out of thin no air. No memory of, of what I mean. I remember having a great time with you guys, but um, <laughs> I, yeah, in terms of like what chapter were we in, uh, I have I have no idea. Um, so so and my terror, by the way, uh, as it is for all of us, I'm sure, is that you repeat stories because you know because people are kind enough to invite me onto. You know, podcasts have exploded, as we know. Sure. So I've done a few, and and the fear is that it's like you start, you launch into a hilarious anecdote, and then you think, "Oh God, I, I did this one a week ago, didn't I?" You know, and it's uh, <laughs> so yeah. But it's your tool. It's your toolkit, man. It's, it's the stuff toolkit. that works. We've all got our stuff that works. So you know, yeah, yeah. But no, I'm, I have to wear that. But interestingly, and it, it actually will relate to that because of the person involved. But although I I wasn't aware of the what was the best thing in your week thing until you, just bef just before we came on air, I, I did think of something be <laughs> because I thought, oh well, God, I, I got to think of something. Um, and oddly, it, it was this um, my. I still think of him as a new friend. He's one of my closest friends, but I've known him over 30 years. Um, but when you're my age, that's still a new friend. Like only high school friends and <laughs> kindergarten friends are like old friends. People, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Tony Randall, who directed Hellbound, uh, that was his. And, and it's not, not Tony Randall from... The odd couple. Oh, or you the, need to right? make that reference, Kevin. Nobody who listens will know who that is. Well, some people might. Who they knows? Will. Yes, was... this is not. It's <laughs> it's the bane of our Tony Randall's life that um, he is not R A N D A L L, the odd couple actor. Um, he is R A N D E L, the director and editor. Um, and Hellbound was his first directorial gig and it was my first screenwriting gig and this is this is literally more than 30 years ago right i shudder to say um but what happened was uh that tony last few years he's been, he's been editing movies primarily um as freelance editor been working consistently but he he has got to a certain point in his life where none of us like to use the word retired but he he is not actively seeking work the way okay. he might have been a couple of years ago. Is it? Can so, I ask you? Is it? Uh, we don't have to unpack that. But is it? Is it by choice, or is he just having? Uh, well, you know, I, th I think there was still um, people would be interested in, in having him do stuff. I, I, yeah. I, I, I certainly would like to think so, and I have no reason to assume otherwise. Um, right. But I think it was. I, th you know. I can say this because I'm six months older than Tony. Sure. Um, so <laughs> he's a 64 year old man. Sure. I think he just thought, I want to put my feet up a little, sure. but, yes. but he didn't want to decay. Um, and so uh, he told me uh, probably around the time lockdown started, I'm going to guess six months, seven months, eight months ago, he said, um, I want to learn the piano. And um, Tony's very musical, by the way. He's, he's always had a good, you know, he uh, his movies have always had good scores because mm -hmm. he always finds good composers and his right. knowledge of film scores is very good. Um, but technically, he was not himself a musician. Right. Um, I think he knew two chords on the guitar or something. But um, so he's naturally musical um in that sense but with no 
skills per se. And he said, I'm going to learn the piano. Yeah. And, and I thought, part of me thought, good for you, man, that's great. And another part of me thought, <laughs> oh, dude, you can't learn anything at your age. Come <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are you thinking? Um, but uh, he has been having virtual lessons uh, with some guy, and um, he has now taken to uh, asking me questions because I, I have a bit of a musical background. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we, we'd done a, a few things where I was aware that he was starting. But yesterday he texted me and said, you want to play some virtual music tomorrow? And, uh, and so this morning I Zoomed with Tony and uh, he was playing some piano. He had his camera on top of the keyboard so I could watch his hands. And, so yeah. him. and I had my guitar and he, he himself would say he's still very much in the learning curve. Yeah. Um, he can't necessarily play something through from beginning to end in, you know, and keep time. But um, it, was, it was a thrilling pleasure to like add this flavor to yeah. our friendship after all these years. Wow. Because, man. Well, you know, Kev, you're, you're musical, obviously, you are Paul too. And there are all these, there's particular delights in a life in the arts, right? And there's right. the delight of, of any kind of live performance with people. It's a, it's a bonding thing. And without any qualitative difference, there's a subtle difference. The, the, there's a musical bond as well. If you, if you play with somebody in a band, you kind of instantly friends or instantly enemies, you know, it's like, um, but so anyway, so Tony and I obviously have had a lot in common and a lot of the uh, artistic commonalities between us, but it was just like, wow, this guy decided he was going to learn piano at the age where most people say, yeah, I know everything I need to know. No. Um, I, so man, it, was, even, it was just delightful. Even, and, uh, so in, in some ways, that was the best thing that happened to me this week. It was that's like, amazing. yeah, good. This is great. Look at this. This guy wants to learn Beatles songs. See, I uh, just think that so, that's well, such, I, I think that that's yeah. such an important thing though, because like even Kate wrote here in the thing, like the learning window doesn't close and it's right. so true. I mean, the fact is, unless I, you I, close it, if, unless if, you close yeah, it, right. listen, we had to deal with this personally with, you know, I know it's a completely different thing, but we, you know, we had to deal with this with our son, Duncan, you know, with, yeah. with his autism, with speech stuff and things that he was dealing with that we had people at a certain point saying, ah, the window's closing, the window's closing. And I remember like hearing that at nine and I just thought, you know, I don't think I'm going to buy that. Yeah. I think I've got invested interest here to like just continue trying to help him. And the fact that we were able to go out and get like private speech therapy or other people to help him was amazing. Right. But, you know, I think that we're all lifelong learners. And to your point, Pete, it's like, yeah, pick something up and keep going right. and keep learning. Right. I mean, how freaking awesome is that for him to be right. burning those synapses and just, and just yeah. making those connections happen. I say, yes. You know, yes. Exactly. Um, so right. he ended up. So, so sorry. yeah. So uh, coincidentally, because of your actual question. Yeah. He, he was a guy who was there. We were there at the beginning of each other's careers. Um, Actually, that, that's sort of arrogant of me. Tony had actually been in the film business for a good seven or eight years. He'd started in a visual effects department uh, at the old New World when Roger Corman still owned it. Another name uh, that G Gen Z can look up, but <laughs> <laughs> Roger Corman was kind of legendary. Um, and so T Tony had worked there and then sidestepped into... Um, the non-creative side. He was an executive. He was a suit, as we contemptuously call them. Um, uh, but he, but he wanted to get back into the creative side. So in that sense, our careers kicked off at the same time because it was my first produced script and his first directorial thing. So uh, the reason I got a shot is. Um, <laughs> This is so depressing for, for everybody to hear. It's all true. It's who you know, not what you know. Because I had a friend in the business. Um, I exaggerate. Uh, but I had been, as I think we talked about last time, I'd been in theater for years with 
a group of friends from my hometown, Liverpool. Um, previously on Pete Atkins, uh, <laughs> we'd, had a, we'd had an avant-garde theatre group in Liverpool, Clive Barker, Doug Bradley, me, several other people, Phil Rimmer, Lynn Darnell, Julie Blake. Um, and Clive had gone on to individual success with his collections of short stories, The Books of Blood, and had sidestepped into movies. Um, he was kind enough to give a producer, well, his producing partner, um, some of my fiction. And um, Chris Figg was the producer in question. And he had been given a budget to make a sequel to Hellraiser and foolishly uh, figured he would take a chance on me. The, the way I've told this story in the past, because uh, yeah, you try and make a story funny rather sure. than true, you sure. know, um, <laughs> is I usually say that Clive called me and said, have you ever written a screenplay? And I said, no. And he said, if a producer calls and asks you the same question, will you lie? And I said, yes. Uh, and five minutes later, Chris Fig called, have you ever written a screenplay? And I said, yes. I, I don't think I consciously misled Chris the way I have claimed in the past. <laughs> but I think what it is, is this, is that uh, Chris Fig, who, just for any Hellraiser nerds who might be listening to this show, because right. we, have, we have very solid which is so touching, you know, after 35 years, we, we still have these people, younger people who like these movies. Chris Fig is somebody who is not celebrated enough in, in the Hellraiser universe um, because uh, the first movie was written and directed by Clive and artistically it's his, absolutely. Right. The movie wouldn't exist without Chris Fig because, you know, as we all know in the business, the producer is the guy who gets things made the, the writer, the director, the writer, director, hyphenate, whatever, might be the guy or woman who makes it. But uh, a good producer is responsible for getting the thing to happen. And Chris Fig absolutely made Hellraiser happen. Wow. Um, New World had passed on their original pitch. Um, and, I, and I think Clive, as, as a good plight middle-class Liverpool boy, had said, oh, well, thanks very much, and sort of to leave. But Chris Fig said, wait a minute, and, and basically resold them. I, I, I was not present at this meeting. Sure. Um, but he resold them and got that entire ball rolling. Um, so it's, it's thanks to him that the first movie and the second movie exist. Wow. Um, and, but what I wanted to say about him was he, he was not an idiot who you could fool with. A, yeah, yeah, I've written screenplays. Sure. Um, like like all good producers should be, what he is is a man who knows that knowing how to format a screenplay yeah. is irrelevant. I mean, well, these days, I mean, even more these days, because these days software does it for you. <laughs> but back then, it's like, well, any idiot can learn how to lay out a screenplay. That's right. not the point, whether you've technically written a screenplay. Um, the issue is, you know, can you think in pictures? Right. Can you can you realize that this medium is something in which you, your writing is not going to be read by your ultimate audience? A little like a right. stage play. It's sure. going to be seen and heard by yes. your ultimate audience. So especially with cinema, certainly with theater, too, you have to get a sense that somebody who wants to work in that medium yeah. can it's a shorthand phrase, think in pictures. Um, yeah. The words have got to be good too. You know. Well, can and, I ask but, you this but, too? But, that, but I, I just, one more word of praise for Chris and then I promise I'll move on. But he was smart enough. He was a smart and enthusiastic man. And he was smart enough to respond to smarts and enthusiasm in others. And mm. I think that's so often the secret that people, you know, people sometimes look at, qualifications on paper or attitude or I, I don't know what, but it's like, if you're going to make things, you want to be looking for that spark. You And mm -hmm. like smartness is important. 
we were just people. talking about this before the yeah, show. Yeah, but but yeah. but you know, enthusiasm, quickness, readiness, um, willingness to learn. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there's this shorthand in, in the phrase. I'm, I'm sure all your listeners are familiar, but you know, good in the room. It's a phrase people throw around a lot, especially for uh, writers in the industry. Being good in the room means you can get plunked down in a room full of not necessarily creative people themselves, and you've got to be able to excite them about the project that they might allow you to work on. Yeah. Um, I, I don't mean this to sound cynical, but... Um, you have to have a sort of natural instinct to to work the room, to mm -hmm. uh, to make them comfortable, to make them at ease with your ability to grasp what is needed. Uh, exercise your charm is a <laughs> phrase I always use, and I, you know you can't you can't fake that shit. Sorry, Kevin, you no, can't you're fake fine. that stuff. Um, <laughs> so you know, f first of all you have to have charm and yes. you have to have personality and you have to have a certain modicum of talent and you, you've got to be good in the room. You've got to be ready to work with people. Yeah. Even if you think it's the dumbest idea you've ever heard from the other side of the desk, don't tell them that. That, that does you no favors. It does them no good. Right. Um, be responsive. Re I, my, my belief is that people who are good in the room are people who can read the room, mm -hmm. you know, be aware of, of what people are responding to, what people want to hear, what they seem to like. Um, so it, I guess it's, it, yeah, I'm outlining a way to be either an artist or a criminal. <laughs> because <laughs> I realize, as I said it out loud, it's like, this is actually the game plan for a con man, right? <laughs> You know, find your marks, uh, set them up, right. make them love you, <laughs> take them for every penny they're worth. Well, I would say this. We're in a very interesting time right now where I thought this. I was with Duncan the other day, and I thought, we're in a strange time where I'm literally turning to my son before we go into a bank and saying, all right, mask up. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Go, mask sure. up. We got to go into a bank. But, you know, that thing that you just talked about, number one, it's it is a collaborative. Art. I think that that speaks. It definitely speaks to when the money and the budget is there when it's huge. Sure. Right. Because when that money goes up, there's a lot right. more there's a lot more eyeballs on it. And to your point, you get a lot of other people that are in the room that are coming from it from an from an executive side, from a business side. And really, because we've talked about this with Scott Damien on the uh -huh. on the show before, too. These people are saying we're making this with hopefully the idea that there's going to be a return on our investment. Sure. And it can be challenging at times to be in those rooms. Now I'm sure that. There's a trade-off that happens when those budgets go lower, right? When the budgets go lower, you get a little bit more say. You think, <laughs> you think, wouldn't you, Kevin? <laughs> Was that right? You've had well, it the other the way. Thing. I, I, in my, in my illustrious career as a Hollywood screenwriter, I never worked for the majors. I never wrote a movie for Disney. Oh, actually, at one point, Disney owned Miramax, who owned the Hellraiser franchise. <laughs> So I guess technically uh, we're all Disney people. That's when, uh, but, but I, I, you know, I didn't write for Paramount. I didn't write for Warner's. That's a lie. I I wrote a project for Warner's that didn't go. We we it ended up not happening. Um, I lost my oh my point was this, but I ha do have a lot of experience with what they used to euphemistically call the mini majors, which were the likes of Miramax, New Line live artisan um and and then the indie production companies i don't think in fact I, what i'm saying but i didn't work for the major so i can't say how bad it gets the higher up you go i do know anecdotally no offense to people who have paid you guys money over the years i've heard disney are terrible in you know, you literally have 14 executives in a story meeting 
Um, I can tell you from working on the live production right, side right. that I have sat in meetings where I just go, what? <laughs> I have sat in meetings where major decisions have been made and I just want to look and go, what is happening? So, right, yes, right. I get it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I've certainly heard that from people that it's like you're really dealing with... Um, many many layers of, of i don't want to say i mean i guess corporate concern would be would be the least um offensive way to say it because yeah. th they are guarding their money and mm. anybody who works for large or medium corporations don't feel bad about that it's like that's their job they should be guarding their money Sure. If it was my money, I'd be guarding it. Right. Um, Because you, you can get people, <laughs> we've all done it, I'm sure. Actors, writers, directors, I, I'm sure designers, composers as well. We can get very defensive and, and a little up in our stuff about, they only care about the money. Of course they do. That's <laughs> their job. They are hired to care about the money. Yeah. What your trick, if you can pull it off, is to persuade them that you are a good investment, mm -hmm. that it's like, you're not, I feel so crippled by your, your limitations on my language, Kev. That I can't... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I'm like, I'm having... It's like the Scott Damien story. He's having to find different ways to say what he, what he wants to say. Because... Right, right. Right, and those tricks. That's sure. it. See, I'm well, just challenging. So, I'm challenging yeah, you creatively. That, what I can say is that the mini majors and the smaller companies, no, I, I've never been in a room with 14 executives. Right. But I think, in a weird and all too human way, um, it's kind of the opposite, Kev. Um, like the fact that they're stuck at a smaller company means, in a way, they want to exercise the executive privileges more Maybe. they want to prove their bones by having even more notes than there's only one of me but i've got as many notes yeah. as those 14 yeah i listen man that that makes absolute sense actually you just saying that right now reminds me of like large business or small business it's like all of a sudden like small business guys are working just as hard if not harder to get stuff right. done and there's a lot more that's on their plate um Except this that that's to be admired i want to be very <laughs> clear that i that i am sneering at the, <laughs> no um <laughs> So, you know, it, it, it's a process and you want to, in a way, it's sort of, I remember at a very impress at a very impressionable age, um, I was, uh, I can't remember who told me this, maybe I saw it in a movie or read it in a book, but uh, yeah, and I'm, as, as I, as I'm sure is already clear from my foul mouth and uh, <laughs> my attitudes, I, I am a blue collar kid. I, I grew up uh, in what we call terraced housing in England, row houses, I guess you'd call it here. Sure. Working class, blue collar kid. Um, but I remember at one point hearing a, a definition of a gentleman and, um, and, you know, England's very class conscious and, and even little, commie agitators like me we want to be gentlemen it's good to be a gentleman that that's a thing to aspire to right. and this particular definition of gentleman was a gentleman is somebody who makes the other person feel comfortable mm. and i thought that was terrific uh, leaving yeah. aside you know any any uh shoring up of the antediluvian class structure that it might also imply it's just a decent thing you yes. know it's like yeah that that's a good definition yeah it's like so i've always attempted you know this is the benign version of what you mentioned earlier kev which i'm guilty of too by the way the need to be a people pleaser right we, we can be mad at ourselves for needing to be a people pleaser but in a way the benign and healthier version of that is don't be so inwardly focused and so selfish that, again, that you're not reading the room. Like, how's that other person in the room feeling? Is, is this okay yeah. for them, for him or her? Are they comfortable? Can I ease the situation by 
being nice, telling a joke, telling a story. Right. Um, See, this I'm, is the thing. This is the thing that pushed your button with the Tom Cruise thing. This is literally the thing that pushed uh, your button with no the doubt. Tom Cruise thing. No doubt. You know? Yeah. I'm sure. like, oh, I get it, Tom. <laughs> I get that yeah, you've got right. all of this stuff right. going, but at least be a damn gentleman about it. <laughs> right. As, as, again, especially if you're in the position of power. Yeah. Um, Pete, question for you. Yes. This just popped in my mind. Yes. Who have been your influences screen screenwriting wise? Because I know that you've kind of, you know, I, I know it's a form that you sort of jumped into and obviously you do, you know, novel writing and all that stuff. And I know that you have influences on that. Has there been anybody that's influenced you screenwriting wise where you go, you know, that's something I would like to emulate, or that's something I would like to incorporate into my stuff when you well, get the opportunity. Um, the, yes and no. Okay. Um, because I did, I, I landed in there, you know, I, I wasn't, in fact, I want to apologize to all my fellow screenwriters for the attitude I had when I was 18, 19, 20, 21. Because like every average film buff, especially from my generation, we had been force fed the auteur theory. So we just assumed instinctively without, you know, rational thought about it, that the director wakes up with an idea grabs a camera, makes a movie. Um, and and I, I, I'd see those credits on screen, I guess, but they were invisible, written by, well, you didn't look at that. Right. Who made the movie? And, you know, made was <laughs> a, a synonym for directed in, yeah. in little film buffs heads. What you like and you literally the minute that you just told me that, I literally remember hearing a story about Sam Peckinpah, the great cowboy director, right? Like all those violent cowboy movies. Yeah, uh yeah. One of the excellent uh, movies. Excellent, yeah. excellent movies, right? Um, but I remember one of the actors that had worked with him one morning uh <laughs> said that you know they were had been waiting out on set and they were out on this desert vista and they're just waiting, and all of a sudden, you know, uh uh a Cadillac pulls up and you know it pulls up in front of his director's chair that was out on this vista and then it just pulls away and then there was Sam Peckinpah just leaning back like looking out and all the actors thought oh he must be trying to contemplate what the vision of the day was and then it just turned out like later he's like working off the worst cocaine and <laughs> you know <laughs> booze hangover and he's waiting for the set doctor to show up and give him his yeah, shot of b12 so he can get the day started right <laughs> so right. i mean like that's the, the you know that's the time frame that you're talking about about like these these you know directors oh, that were just like made yeah, by the, you know was, there was a there was a, an arc and a history to the auteur theory that the french came up with it first and then it was adopted in the 60s and 70s by a bunch of American critics and academics, primarily Andrew Saris, I think, uh, another name that might have dropped out of common cultural consciousness. He was Gollum. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, well, he revoiced Gollum, I guess. <laughs> um, but Saris became the big leading American exponent of the auteur theory, and, and auteur is French for author, and the assumption was that the director is the author of the movie. Now, the auteur theory is fantastic when you have auteurs. Um, but, you know, two things. Not every director is an auteur. And, and you must uh, have been on some you must have been on some of my commercial uh, shoots. There were several <laughs> directors where I just literally went, how did you get this job? So go ahead. Continue. Um, <laughs> but but yeah no but I, I bought into that too well you know because the finished product we see obviously the guy in charge on set is is the director or the woman on charge on set is the director so uh, I I don't want to sidestep into the auteur arguments but you know the point is unless you're a hyphenate unless you're a writer director um, you don't make the movie you direct the movie and somebody else has perhaps written it. Um, and that's that. But my point is that I 
I'm trying to let me think of I'm just going to pull something out from when I was like 18 when I saw Carrie when I saw the adaptation of Stephen King's Carrie yeah um I, I was knocked out by it I loved yeah. it and I thought my god this Brian De Palma guy and and I was right to think that because it was it was a bravura directorial exercise full of fabulous flourishes great visual style uh, as were the movies he'd made before Carrie and as were a couple of the movies he made after Carrie. Um, but I just, it was like a writer, especially because this was an adaptation of a book. It never occurred to me that there's another creative mind in the middle of that process. Yeah. You've got the source material, which is the Stephen King novel. You've got the movie we see in the theater, which has that big, a Brian De Palma film on it. Um, but in fact, uh, as I learned subsequently, a guy called Lawrence Cohen, not Larry Cohen of Flying Serpent fame, a different Larry Cohen, mm -hmm. um, turned one of King's, in a way, least cinematic on the page novels yeah. yes. into a very viable screenplay. Um, uh, the point I'm making is simply that that was invisible to me yeah. as a young film fan. I didn't go around bad mouthing screenwriters. I, it was sort of an invisible, it was an invisible job. I mm. guess I assumed the directors wrote them mm. if I gave it any conscious thoughts at all. <laughs> Very long winded answer to your question, Kev. I'm sorry. What I would say is this by the time I was writing, it literally was by the time I was writing a movie that was about to be produced. That was the first time that I thought, oh yeah, right. Somebody writes these things. <laughs> I, I, and, and I exaggerate for humorous effect that much. That's all yeah. it's, I knew scripts existed. Yeah. But I'd seen them, you know, um, but it really was a case of, so in that sense, whereas I clearly, I have come to admire um, both older screenwriters, my contemporaries, other screenwriters of my generation, younger screenwriters, I admire them now, but that's all sort of after the event. Like I was already an established, um, well, established. I'd had a couple of jobs, um, yeah. but I was in the business before, <laughs> before it occurred to me to think, oh, who's good at this stuff? It's crazy. It's, it's, it's crazy, um, right? That we have, ways, you know, it, I'm sorry about that. You just cut out for one second, but oh. I was just going to say it's crazy how sometimes we fall into into some of these things. That sometimes we fall into opportunities, and we're literally learning as we go. Sure. And I think that that's a thing of just like, and it sounds like it's something that happened. You know, obviously in your career, I know that I've had versions of it. Paul's had versions of it, where all of a sudden you stumble into something and go okay, I'm learning this on the fly and just right. trying to figure this out as I go, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Something else. Gosh. And I mean, and sometimes you're learning on the go and, it's, and, and you have this horrible feeling of, I'm learning as I go and this isn't for me, um, <laughs> which is terrible. And sometimes, thank the Lord, you have the opposite thing, which is I'm learning as I go and I like this. Yeah, and and also if if you'll forgive the ego for a minute, you also have that moment of, oh, I I can do this. It's like that that yeah. sense of uh, I might even be good at it. You know, I mean, you hopefully one keeps one's ego in check, but you yeah. do you do have a sense of oh, I feel home here. You know. Um, yeah. So I think we've frozen again. Have we frozen again? You did. You're okay. You came You came back. We're getting you back a little bit. We've been having this happen the I'm last- I'm getting a lot of echo back from you. That's okay, okay buddy. So my We're... internet connection, maybe? Oh, we look good again now. Okay. Now you're back. That's Did... okay. Don't worry, because we got we got most of that, uh, which just- Had finished... I managed to get through that Here's... endless Here... ramble? <laughs> we did. You know what we're going to do with you, Pete, which is something that we yeah. did with our standby. Are you good? Can you hear us? We had this happen last week too, huh, Paul? Yeah. 
Okay, uh, no, I, I can hear. I can hear you now. Here's what we're gonna. Here's what we're gonna do to also solve it, which is gonna be good. Can you do us a favor? Can you just turn off your video part of it? Because if you turn off the video part of it, we'll be able to just do the audio part, and then that we may be able to hear that even even a little bit better. Um, yeah. So you just hover overneath where the where it says stop video. Stop video. Yeah. Stop the video. So that doesn't. That's okay. We're going to lose you camera wise, but we will still be able to hear you audio wise and it should probably help clean up the signal. So just hold on for one second. You're a good man. We have, we've had this happen the last couple of times on some things with, there you go. Can you hear us? Perfect. I can hear you great. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had to do this last week too. Sometimes with some of the Wi-Fi signals that we deal with, uh, with people's different internet, it's usually a little bit better just as we're hearing audio. So now your thing isn't getting the, the video part of it isn't getting, uh, stressed as much. We got most of that, but finish that last thought, which is this, which is the idea of just learning as you go and realizing, Oh yeah, you know what? I'm actually kind of good at this and I like this. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I suddenly realized as I said that, I, I didn't want that, that to sound egotistical. I guess the word I should have used, well, now let's be honest. Yeah. You, you can sort of tell when you have an aptitude for something, when right. something feels like home for you. Yeah. But, but I guess the, 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 the more general word would be comfortable. It's like, yeah. oh, I, I like this, you know, it's like, um, the first time, whatever it may be, the first time you you do a soliloquy in, on stage or, you know, you just think, oh, this is, uh, I wouldn't mind continuing to do this. You know, that, <laughs> that's the, what's the, uh, what's the thing the kids say now? Well, I don't hate it. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't hate it if. Um, so, yeah, you get that sense. Um, yeah. And I, I yeah, I, I, I felt a sort of natural affinity with screenwriting when I did it. And I have to say, although I had written prose prior to it, and in fact, as I mentioned, it was kind of what got me the job. Chris Fig read a novella of mine, Mm -hmm. um, which sort of proved to him that I could write, um, you know, whether it was a movie or not. But, um, But although I'd started in prose, I am, you know, regardless of uh, the, its own rewards that screenwriting brought. Um, I was also grateful because in terms of prose writing, fiction writing, screenwriting is really good. And, I, and I, there are certain novelists I would happily recommend taking a six month sabbatical to write a screenplay or two because screen, good screenplays um, teach a writer three very important things, okay. uh, which is precision, clarity, and economy. Mm. It's like you you have about a third of the word count of an average novel in a screenplay. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to hold the audience's attention. You're writing, whether it's drama or comedy, in other words, drama capitally, you're writing drama small d, even if it's a comedy, whatever it is, you're writing for people. So it's yeah. like, this better sound like something people can say. Mm. Um, and not only is it going to sound like something people can say, but they better be snappy. Yeah. Like <laughs> you, don't, you don't want long, clearly there are exceptions that prove the rule here, here and there. But for the most part, it's like, yeah, you learn to be concise clear and very precise in your language because you don't have the luxury of um i will now explore the confusions of the soul that gregor d was feeling the moment the morning he woke up it's like no, no. <laughs> have something fall outside the window describe oh, yeah. it uh describe it tight yeah. so that uh, the crew can film it uh, so it, it's like it, it is it is a very useful learning tool for all kinds of writing because it keeps you focused it's like uh, tell this thing keep it moving keep it entertaining wow um what a that- great what a great exercise that even just you talked about like even as you were talking about that it made me just you know there's some things i've been working on in writing and just going yeah. gosh story stuff it'd be almost worth it as an exercise to go yeah can you tell this as a short film screenplay you know 
or even the interesting thing that you see now with uh, with some books or novels that are now being turned into like mini series or limited series. It's like, yeah, that's a different. It's still a different beast, you know, sure. because you're not going to get all of the in you know interior monologue that's going on with a the interior voice is the thing not literally you know because you you can have voiceovers whatever but um the the interiority of your protagonist is kind of the thing is the tool you don't have when you're writing a screenplay um yeah this is often shorthanded as all the cliches you hear you know show don't tell um some of the best movies tell, you know, it's like um, showing is good. Telling is fun too. So, you know, like most rules, don't take them as a rule. Yeah. Because it's BS, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> it's a guideline at best. By the way, Kev, do you like the fact I said BS? <laughs> I still... I'm so proud of you right now, Pete. I am so proud of myself. It's, uh... <laughs> I but hey, uh... let's, I, I want to do this before, before, before we lose you tonight too, because I want to, uh, Pete, you can probably see it there. We were talking about beforehand. Would tell it, please tell us about this painting real quick. Cause I want to point people. Oh, sure. Uh, well, this, this is, um, well, this means a lot to me actually, because uh, not because of what it is, but because of who did it. Um, what you're looking at the, is a, is a section of the cover of my short story collection, uh, rumors of the marvelous, which came out, Actually, the hardcover came out, which is what this was painted for. The hardcover came out uh, nine years ago now. Uh, paperback came out four years ago, and and just a few short months ago, folks, the ebook came out. So it's available right now on Amazon. <laughs> um, but uh, the important thing about this is that that um, <laughs> portrait of the author as a not so young man uh, is the work of the great Les Edwards. Um, who uh, might be a name not known to to your listeners and viewers, but Les is um, is is well not one of the last. I hope there'll be many more, but is one of the great exponents of the painted book cover, mm -hmm. which is a lot less common these days than it used to be. Right. Um, if you look back to the you know those great paperbacks of the fifties that you've seen, the painted cover was it was a very common uh staple of publishing yeah. um now the photo cover or the no image at all just fancy fonts are the kind of the default things for most books uh and can be great i mean don't get me wrong there's some uh, fantastic high style font only book covers out there but um les is like in in, in this tradition that dates back to like your Frank Frazetta's, your Roy Crankles, oh your gosh, J. Yeah. Allen St. John's, yes. these people who did these fantastic painted covers. Now, th the only problem with this one is that Les was constrained because some idiot said, why don't you do a portrait of the author? Because what Les normally does right. uh, is much more like Frazetta, Crank Crankle, J. Allen St. John, those people. He yes. is um, within our pond, whatever size that pond may be. Les is a big fish in, in uh, the world of illustrative book covers. Yeah. So, and he's also, by the way, a lovely guy. Yeah. Uh, he and his wife, Val, are people I've known for, Christ, again, probably 25 years now, maybe more. Um, and he's a sweetheart, but um, you always forget that sometimes, you know, your sweetheart friends are like these significant people, these significant yeah. artists. And um, I don't want to go on about this picture so much because it's just me, but, <laughs> but, I, but I would really, uh, I would urge people who have any kind of interest in fine illustration to go check out, you know, lesedwardsart.com, where yeah. you will see a gallery of magnificent work that he's been doing for the last I, again, I don't want to out it. He's a little older than me. Sure. Not much, actually. A little older than me. But he's been, so he's been doing this, I want to say, almost 50 years. He's certainly wow. been doing it 40 years. And um, well, go check him out, people. Go, Les go Edwards at lesedwardsart.net. I, I believe is? the website is lesedwardsart.com. Okay. Uh, you can we'll say producer, producer Les Craig Edwards on Facebook and, 
And if he's got any brain cells at all, there will be a link to the website. We'll do um, it. We'll have it on the show. I mean, especially in uh, my own area, which is horror fiction. Um, right. He's done some fantastic, fantastic horror covers. So. Looks like producer Craig's got it up there right now. Thank you, buddy. LesEdwards.com. Go check that out. I didn't want to. I didn't want to miss that opportunity because right. that uh, that artwork was absolutely amazing. Um, Pete, as always, it's like our time has just flown by. As I, always, I realize we uh, this this uh, the as as I said previously on Pete Atkins. So we've advanced the plot about two weeks. I think <laughs> I think we're in about nineteen eight early part of nineteen eighty eight now, right? Hey man, I didn't even get to talk to you about. I wanted to talk to to Pete about uh, his his love of the Beach Boys and how much uh, he has made has opened my eyes about the Beach Boys. By the way, if you want to see a fantastic movie, what was it called? It was just out a few years ago with John Cusack and Paul yeah, Dano. Love, love and mercy. mercy. Holy smokes, Pete! We're not even going to touch on that tonight because that could be a whole episode on itself. Wait, what but, did he do for that movie? Well, he didn't do anything for that movie, but what we could talk about is we could talk about Pete loves rock and roll so much. By the way, he did our soundtrack for uh, years ago. We were in a play called The Gin, a musical, and uh, it was actually a musical version of Pete's screenplay, Wishmaster, which was a horror movie that he did years ago. Uh, Pete, is that soundtrack available at all? Have you put that soundtrack up anywhere? You mean I was- The well, Gin, the musical? Uh, I have I have not because I was I'm such a late adopter and such a technophobe. Um, actually, you know, first of all, I want to tell your listeners that what, what Kevin isn't mentioning is that Kevin was the lead in that show. Kevin played what the gym um, <laughs> and was terrific. And I mean, I, I know you push for time, Kev, but let me actually, let me say this to this day. You are a, a friend of mine's definition of commitment. This is uh, another screenwriter friend of mine. You might even have met him a couple of times, Richard Nathanson, uh, who's you know sold some features and made his own movies. Uh, he was a pen and, he wrote for Penn and Teller on mm -hmm. the. I have to say the word this time, Kev, because it's the name of the show. <laughs> he wrote for Bullshit. The show is called <laughs> Bullshit, <laughs> and uh, Rich was a writer on that show and, and did some other stuff with. Um, Penn and Teller. Anyway, he came to see the gin 20 years ago. You know, it's like 19 years since we did that show. I know it is. It's crazy. Uh, we had uh, Jeffrey, we had Jeffrey Rush and Orlando Bloom come see that show. Like we were right? in the, Yes. They, are you sure? They came to see Randy's show, didn't oh, they? Oh, sorry. Gosh darn yeah. it. I'll turn around. Yeah, that Randy. Uh, sorry. He's a good guy. No, I, <laughs> I was the, thinking about that because we did all that stuff at the same theater. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. But um no, uh, Rich oh, has said at the time to me and has said many times since the definition of commitment, there, there was like, you know, what they call the 11 o'clock number in musical theater. And there's a point at which Kevin has exited uh, the stage. It's too complicated to explain why, because two people were playing the same character. Kevin goes off stage, something happens, and then Kevin re-enters from the side of the stage. And there was something about the energy that Kevin brought to this he would grab the curtain and lean in. His whole body would lean forward and pick up on verse three. And Richard Nathanson always said, that's, that's commitment. Like when you want to show people what commitment is, you should tell them about that guy. <laughs> uh, which, which I that's thought sweet. of the other day, by the way, when I was watching Matty and the Swells I know. Uh, live show, because in the sketch segment, so, you know, Matty's cooking corner. I know. That kid has commitment. Yes, he does. It's, uh, you know, so he comes by it naturally. Go back and see it. Go see that. Go see that on Twitch. I really appreciate your friend saying that. And Matty does not buy, abide by the same rules as his father. Plenty of cussing in that. Oh, sure. Stream, oh, so. yes. oh, he's young. He's young. <laughs> Although, interestingly, um, the Autobot that polices the comments on Twitch does not approve of cussing because it deleted my comment. Um, oh, it's listen, just to give you a heads up, everybody about, sorry, I'm just going to say this about certain types of editing and stuff that happens on things. I have to say this. 
on Twitch. Maddie's not going to mind me saying this. So they did a release party of um, of the album a couple of weeks before. And literally, here's the crazy thing. They it's their music that they're playing. They started streaming their music on Twitch and automatically rights management came up and shut down their stream saying <laughs> you're using, you're using played stuff and they go, ah, it's ours. And then I'll have to tell you this. They literally had one of their band members that was in the back that had a beer, a bottle of beer that was open and 30 seconds in, they shut them down saying excessive drinking on our, on the, on the thing. So it's like, it's almost like Al, Al, the, I'm going to say that wrong. Algorithmic police that you just go, you guys are completely out of context. And believe me, I'm a big free speech guy. Do the things that you want. But when we get that far, it's just like, it's nonsense. It's silly. You know? Yeah. That seems a little crazy. Anyway. Sorry. Pete Atkins. I wish I could have you on for three or four more hours. Yeah. Um, no, it was great. Thank you. And I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm sorry that we progressed two weeks in the master narrative. <laughs> um, but this is, you know, it's just my secret plan to make you keep inviting me back. So, uh, <laughs> I like uh, Paul, any any thoughts? Bef- any thoughts before we jump off into the into the evening? Into just the- that, um, you know, Tony Randall has a problem with. People, you know, thinking he's the other Tony Randall. Uh, a lot of people don't know Kevin Gregg's problem um, that has plagued him throughout his career. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> so true. This has honestly, Paul. This what what people on the audio podcast are not saying. And let me let me tell you something about this. Sorry, you just launched a rant, buddy. Uh, <laughs> so what the people on the audio podcast are not seeing is that the baseball player. Kevin Gregg has popped up. There's a there's a professional base. I think he's re- is he retired now? Does he still play or no? A few years ago, yeah. He retired a few years ago. Um, Kevin Gregg is a is also a professional baseball player. He's a couple of years younger than me. He was born in 1978. I was born in 1972. And boy, when I was trying to get onto these internets and first start getting your stuff out there, anytime that you would top a, a, type in Kevin Gregg. <laughs> Up would pop the thing. And here's another thing. My middle name is Matthew. So I would sometimes go by Kevin M. Gregg. Don't worry. Kevin Gregg's middle name is Marshall. So he would go as <laughs> Kevin M. Gregg. And anyway, there was also a time period where he played for the Anaheim Angels for a little oh. while. So while I was also doing stuff at Disney or trying to use that, don't worry. Kevin Gregg was also in Anaheim at the same time. So I don't know. How was this? His career was okay, right? I mean, he was kind of like a relief pitcher. Did you follow him at all, Paul? He was or? A relief pitcher, yeah. He, uh, he was for a never, number of teams. He, yeah, he worked for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he, had, he had a pretty decent career. I have no idea what he's doing now. But anytime I would type in my name, I would usually see raging Major League Baseball fans getting angry at something that he did for a closer. <laughs> <laughs> Just going. <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> We yes, I, I have the same thing. Seriously, I mean, I, oh yeah, I we're running out of time. But there is, um, there is a famous. Uh, his profession is chemist. He, he's a chemistry professor at the University of Oxford. Um, yes. But his avocation, you'll love this, Kev, yes. is he is one of the world's leading atheists. Yes, I can um, know this. And he is also a published author. You know, yes. obviously, primarily chemistry textbooks, but. It's the bane of my internet existence. Yes. Well, again, you're, like I, you, it's not only Peter. At- oh, we just lost you for a second. It's not only Peter. It's Peter Atkins. Greg, he too yeah. is Peter W. Atkins. He has oh, the gosh, same. Gosh, we just interface. lost you again for a second, Pete. No, say oh, that last thing. Not only is it is it like Peter Atkins author because he pops up as Peter well, Atkins author. Not, but what I was saying specifically was that just like you, the middle initial is the same too. Oh gosh. Oh my. So. Um, well, here's another thing, Pete. Which you, I, I did like a Google search on you the other day. There's also a Christian minister who goes by Peter Atkins now, that oh, does stuff. So. Oh, well, that that's interesting. There was um, there was a. I assume this is a different one, but there was an Anglican bishop um, in the UK <laughs> c- called Peter Atkins. Um, 
And but he seems to he, he and he too published a book called yeah. On Creation. Yes. Uh, so you know you go searching on Amazon and it's like there's 54 chemistry textbooks. <laughs> I, but what I what I loved was that the first guy I mentioned was this zealous, like you know, public debate yes. uh, champion atheist. Yes. And there's this guy who is an Anglican bishop. Yeah. Anglican is, I guess, what is it? Es Episcopalian over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an Anglican bishop. So I felt, as a horror writer, I really sat between the two. <laughs> you know, it was like, you got your hardcore nothing exists beyond this world yeah. and you've got your man of god and then you got me sitting in yeah. the middle saying yes. yeah there is more stuff than just this world but it, it mightn't be great <laughs> <laughs> pretty awesome pete love you dearly buddy That's just glad that you're fantastic guys thank you can i click the video back on just so i can wave goodbye to anybody yeah you can and, st and stick around for a second because i'll tell you what we're going to sure. do we're just going to quickly end the audio podcast and everything in a second so go ahead click click on that beautiful face of yours there, there he is. is everybody but i'll just i'll keep silent so it's not oh too no it's way speed. it's it's always <laughs> a joy always a pleasure no, it's been great thank you guys thank you you bet man oh. well, i guarantee you this is probably one of 12 more visits so <laughs> there you go but just just put me on the monthly schedule <laughs> that's it that's it uh we want to wish everybody a merry christmas for goodness sake i know the people that are hearing this on the audio podcast will hear it later but uh merry for christmas you guys, happy new year and for you guys that are listening on the audio podcast, happy new year. May 2021 be better for all of us, please. Get your vaccination. Dear God in heaven, please. Uh, Paul, final thoughts on how people can hear, help us and hear us. People can hear us anywhere that they consume podcasts. I sometimes will go to the website, yourcreativejourneypodcast.com. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I listen on Spotify. Sometimes I listen on Apple Podcasts. And sometimes I listen on iHeartRadio. One really cool way to help people find us wherever they can is by leaving us a positive review on Apple Podcasts. If you do that, maybe a lot new listeners will find the show. And the coolest thing is we'll read your re review live online, just like... Well, I'm going to take a look. That Maybe I'm going to roll the dice here, buddy. I'm going to roll the dice. I haven't looked it up before the show. Maybe someone else wrote a review. Maybe well, someone I, else. I, I wish I'd thought to put one up there. <laughs> I'll tell you who keeps, I'll tell you what's kind of neat. Okay. So we keep getting Gooby 114. And I don't know if this is like an automatic thing. She, this is a, a, a review that she wrote a while ago, but you know, like every month, the same review keeps uh, kind of re upping. It's, hmm. it's interesting. Russian. She always says every month, really enjoying the show every week, Paul and Kevin lead us through amazing journeys and tell us about some very amazing friends along uh, that they make along the way. Uh, mm -hmm. They inspire you to do the best. Uh, they inspire me to do the best I can do to work on my craft and be who I want to be. Now that review is an older review, but for some reason on Apple podcasts, it always re ups. So maybe if Gooby, if you're doing that every month, I just want to say thank you for doing that. Yeah. So I don't know if I've heard that before. So thank you, Gooby. You bet. It's a good thing. At the very least, share this. If you enjoy the stuff that you've heard with Pete Atkins, go on the website, yourcreativejourneypodcast.com. Take a look at our past episodes. We've had some amazing guests. Like I couldn't, I couldn't be happier with the guests that we've had. Pete is, is amongst that lineup. That's just, it's really just great to hear. So Merry Christmas to you all. Happy belated Hanukkah uh, and happy new year to one and all. That's what we got to say. And happy Boxing Day. And happy Boxing oh, Day. Oh, nice little Anglophile reference there. That's right. Yeah. I wish I, I wish I was with you, Pete, so we could enjoy our Christmas crackers this year. And, oh, you know, but Please. what we can't do anymore, because, you know, Kevin has given up all the fun things. <laughs> Nicotine, foul language, yes. and alcohol. Yeah. That's and it's right. so sad because one thing, it's not sad at all. I applaud you, Kevin, of course. But yeah. yeah, we used to have Christmas in a glass. That's right. It was whiskey. Coke. Yeah, yeah, it was it was whiskey and, and Coke. And it was just I like, and Pete, and Coke, yeah. it was. And, and Pete's actually, Pete's quick story with this was that he tasted it. And he once said to me, he said, tastes like Christmas. Tastes like Christmas. <laughs> so anyway. Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. God bless Merry you all. Merry Christmas, Mr. Potter. 
Thank you for joining us. We will talk to you next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Bye. Pete. Uh, YouTube people, thank you so much. What a blessing. You guys are awesome. Thank you for all of your comments. I'm sorry that we couldn't read them all where you're going, but it looks like you guys were having a blast. Grateful for each and every one of you. Paul, you've been up too late tonight. You've had too much stuff on your plate. So I'm going to end this live stream and Bye. say thank you. Bye. To Anything you want to say to the folks? Remember, head over, buy your tickets now for Vodacity Network because they got the New Year's Eve bash that's coming oh, up. Yeah. Yeah, I do want to talk to you about a couple of things. One is yeah. uh, we talked about that like a while ago. Like, Could we do yes. like, a 10-minute chat Pop about in. the new year? We will do it. Cool. And then um, we're releasing, we're showing the Haunted Man to our crowd funders on the first of the year in the evening. Oh, and this did- is an independent film that he's worked on, Pete. For those of you that are just joining us and have an independent film that he worked on three years ago, got, got all the money for it, full feature film that they finally did, finally have gotten this edited, co- bam, it's ready to go. First of the year, you guys are going to show it, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to see if you're around and available, if you might want to do like a uh, Q&A with the everybody. Oh, love the show. I love it. Yes, let's let's talk and figure that out. I think it'd be awesome. I would love to do that because we've already had an example of that on the show a yeah, little while ago. And I thought you did pretty good. You did all right. Thanks, buddy. I guess so. Um, hey, YouTube folks, we're going to say our bye byes to you. Have a Merry Christmas. We'll see you here next week. We've got James Dornoff coming on. Shoot, I don't have this in front of us. In two weeks, we've got Bonnie Utley, who's coming on the show. She is an awesome creative coach, and Dana Middleton does some great creative coaching as well. She's got to tune in to to see the show. But I will tell you this. I'm going to throw this out to my YouTube listeners that are here now. Can I ask this? Bonnie asked me this specifically because as we were having a talk, sorry, I'm I'm going to repeat this for a couple of weeks. Bonnie Utley, I've worked with her before. She's amazing with helping people push through and work towards the stuff that they're trying to do specifically. She asked me to ask our audience this. If there's one thing that you could walk away from with an episode with her next week, if there's one thing that you wanted to walk away from, if you had a creative coach that was to help you with something specifically – what would that be? What's the problem that you're dealing with? What's the challenge that you're dealing with? So if you have a specific question, either write it in the comments or you can email me at kevin at kevingreg.com. And guess what? I'm going to get that question to her early so she can answer that question for you when she meets with us two weeks from now. So if there's something that you're dealing specifically and you want to say to yourself, what's the one highest thing that I wish that I could walk away with if I had somebody that was a coach that was to help guide me through, what's the one thing that I could walk away from with an episode? What would that be? Write that question down or send me that question at Kevin at KevinGreg.com and I will and I will forward that on to Bonnie. And what do you know? It may get answered on that show two weeks from now. <laughs> or send so. it to me at Paul at KevinGreg.com. <laughs> or send it to me at Pete at KevinGreg.com. Well, at- all of those email addresses don't exist don't yet. Exist. <laughs> I'll have to work it out. So anyway, YouTube people, think about that and send me that stuff. We'll remind you about this next week as well, too. We're going to end our live stream. Stick around, Pete, Paul. We'll talk to you afterwards. God bless you guys. Have a Merry Christmas, and we will see you next time. I'm going to end this good old live stream right